An Italian chronicler of the early Renaissance tells us how Florence for several years knew no real fashions in male apparel as every man chose to dress in his own unique manner. Yet, when one looks at portraits from the period displaying people largely as they wanted to be seen and when one thinks about how they appear in literature of the period, one cannot fail to notice a certain uniformity of style, how their forms appear to us, their disposition and gestures, and the impression made by the details within the whole. All of this announces a common ethos and attitude towards life. It is this element of commonality despite all the individualization that in the end leads individuals to present themselves as bearers of a type with a more or less generalized character or temperament. Oh, aesthetic. A word that I dread to hear nowadays because my niche is defined by aesthetics, whether I embody or analyze them. Oh, by the way, lip gloss. Aesthetic is a word that's been used to death in recent years, especially online. And the worst part about this word is that it does not describe the formal elements of an object now, as much as it defines a certain type of person, a set of useful, marketable skills and characteristics that can easily describe an entire whole being in 10 words or less. Being a social media content creator makes the current makes the current compartmentalization of personalities and skills extremely obvious. It is a perfect metaphor and a perfect lens that I am forced to look through. It is especially easy to be painfully aware of it when your job is to talk about aesthetics. We will talk about how this affects everyone, people who are not using social media whatsoever as well. But first, I gotta present you with the concept as a whole and why it is detrimental, at least in my opinion, for us to constantly remind ourselves of our actual wholeness in all this aesthetic mess. I have been working in the arts or media related fields for a few years now and one of the biggest issues that shows up again and again when I and my peers are trying to build our careers is the issue of being perceived the correct, correct way. Most importantly, the correct way does not mean that people understand your art in some kind of objective way that is not warped by subjectivity in any type of way, which is honestly a topic in itself in those circles, and we'll talk about it some other time, but in a sense of being taken seriously. This is where aesthetics and marketing and the dreaded word image come into play. The worst fucking enemy of anyone who's an actual artist, I tell you that. But we are forced to find ways to generate enough revenue to justify doing art in general because nowadays you can't really be just making art that's not really an option unless you are extremely wealthy or just have somebody else paying your bills or helping you with your bills whatever it is this by the way is only a real problem for people who have to make it on their own because people who have money even if not crazy amounts of money but just more than minimum wage type of money will always have another chance most importantly they will always have a choice if you don't have to take every deal if you don't have to follow the audience or the art critics or the elusive algorithm to pay for the bare necessities or just to have a chance to work on your art practice part-time you will be able to curate a lot more vigorously <laughs> the extreme curation is a disease of the masses at this point. It used to be more of a celebrity thing with people of other fields having to reconcile these issues between their everyday self-identity and the public perception just like once in a while. Now with everyone having to make some kind of side hustle out of everything we do, many people have to market themselves a lot more than they used to, analyzing themselves as an image a lot more than they used to, making it basically impossible to get some rest from perceiving yourself. This is why my channel is so perfect to discuss this. My channel as an example of it. Because I'm not in algorithm's favor. And one of the big problems or reasons for it, as any creator or social media manager would tell you, is my unwillingness not only to niche down, which um, could be still remedied, but even keeping the tone consistent. The only thing unifying all of my videos is me and uh, who I am as a person, I guess. Which is just not the best social media strategy today. If you think of someone like um, 
I think Madeline RG. I don't know how to pronounce her name exactly, but that girly on TikTok. And you think, well, her stuff is based on her personality. See, Lisa, it's not true. Well, you using this example would kind of be like comparing apples and oranges, to be honest. Her character is very much within the confines of a type of person, a type of person that does do well online. She is kind of like Emma Chamberlain 2.0. And especially, it's really weird that the whole hygiene thing is also something Thing that was a part of their brand in the beginning is that a th what's going on with that i'm really curious and she doesn't really produce content that requires research or experimentation or scripting even so since my content requires all of the things that i just named and my videos usually appeal to a certain type of person each type of video to a different type of person that's where the issue lies <laughs> if you are a neat niche or aesthetic if you have a gimmick that people know you for and that you can constantly replicate you're in and you know i don't really make the exact type of videos all the time even though i do try to have some genres of videos on my channel that i go through constantly like i don't just drop a type of video entirely but i try to define them in some type of way like video essay deep dive commentary or review uh styling you know, that type of stuff. I make so many types of genres of videos that I would have to create at least six channels to separate those types into six cohesive and streamlined channels, which is once again, not a solution because then it would require as many videos as I post on this one channel to be posted on six channels because what? Quantity is always over quality on the internet. Yes, there are a few people everyone can name who get to you know take their time they can uh hire somebody to do editing or research for them or whatever it is right but usually those people got lucky with a few of their videos or one of their videos and usually quite early in their career so and those people who haven't gotten lucky earlier in their career and they had to kind of work for a really long time to get to where they are today they usually do not say stupid shit like this because we all know how it works and we're kind of more familiar with how it can be kind of difficult if you didn't get lucky right off the bat right this job is all about marketing yourself and what you create. The part that really makes it a doozy is the fact that we all have to do this now. Obviously, not to this extent. There's definitely been a change, okay? And it is connected to money and our ability to survive. And you know, here is where this shit becomes annoying, babes, okay? Money is placed between man and man, between man and product, as a mediator, as a general denominator into which every other value must be translated so that it can be further translated into other values. Since the beginning of money economy, the objects of economic relationships are no longer immediate to us. Our interest in them is expressed not in their individual and functional meaning, but only through the medium of money. We are putting distance between who we are and who we appear to be by constantly creating aesthetics that will reflect us accurately. <laughs> you can't determine whether someone is a ballet core girl by asking them if God is real. You can't even do it by the fact that they're wearing foundation, for example, even though it is a very surface level aesthetic denominator both can give you a hint of what aesthetics they would be in maybe a little bit depending on the aesthetic but you need a whole ass list of things and with time more and more specific things to have a niche aesthetic determined for someone who subscribes to it so just like with something like a painting you can't stand this close to it where you can barely even see an inch of the actual painting you gotta see the full picture to say that it is for example an impressionist painting you have to step away from others and especially from yourself to collect that information that can be nicely packaged and sold online or in real life for jobs sponsorships and even relationships because what the fuck do you think we're doing on dating apps babes this distance creation from our own damn selves makes us create distance with other things and people too the way that we have to market ourselves all the time makes us feel like a commodity or an object 
that we ourselves consume, which in turn makes us pad these relationships to ourselves, to people, to things, to even activities with money. And it is enforced by different types of things, like for example, the disappearance of the third space or spaces and you know lack of things that we could do together or apart that wouldn't require money i know that this is like a little bit of a difficult connection to get from somebody just telling it to you so i'm gonna explain what i mean by padding this space with money what i mean is the fact that even the most basic interactions are related to money now we can't really meet anywhere unless we go for a coffee or for some kind of activity that would also cost money in some cities with more bustling culture <laughs> you might gonna be able to find something else or at least more things to choose from you might find it in places that haven't been penetrated by extreme individualism but most of the time the activities that we can afford or the aesthetics that we can afford paint the personal experiences we have because of how people that we can potentially interact with read that information off of us most of all a large portion of the population stopped doing things just for fun. I had a weird experience of going to a dance class and suddenly realizing that I enjoyed so much and not even because of the activity itself, but because I didn't have to be good at it. And it wasn't for some kind of revenue creation. And at the same time, because of that, because it costs money and it does not produce money, it immediately made me feel like I should have been doing it. I felt guilty. I felt like I'm wasting my time, which is absolutely ridiculous, by the way. I don't care what anybody thinks. I think that that kind of way of living is ridiculous. And it's really unfortunate that we ended up here. But and the thing is, all of this marketing, constant marketing, even for people who work in STEM, is that personal and professional have become not only enmeshed as they used to be before in one way or another, but they were forced to become one entirely. It used to be that you were supposed to be a certain way at work, which included acting like you're not even a human being, biologically speaking. And now you have to have a public image, which has been moved online by force since, you know, you need a LinkedIn and also can't really use your real name online unless you want the boss to see what you tweet on a Sunday afternoon, you basically have to constantly monitor yourself. And by the way, I'm not talking about weirdos who are like parts of hate groups or some shit like that, you know? I'm talking about just um, the fact that you could be taken not seriously if someone finds you posting memes. Sure, there are many workplaces that kind of understand this relationship and don't act like weirdos that think that you can't post a meme without losing some professional respect for you or something. But when you work in the arts or business or politics, any type of work that is facing the public, your personal is going to be your professional, at least to a very uncomfortable degree with no room to breathe. Because if you don't courage yourself just so, you're not going to capitalize on your niche and miss out on being paid for all the other things that you've done that are not as marketable or as snappy, you know? So let me get back to why niching down and curating yourself can be bad for creators, especially for those that have more than one gimmick or one thing to say or deliver. It's all about how we started to see ourselves as like a static image of a bunch of fragments instead of a whole being. I saw so many people on TikTok commenting something along the lines of, I can't even see my face as one thing anymore. I only see facial features. Like I see my eyes and my nose and my lips and my cheeks, every single part of the face or the body as separate things. And I cannot put them together for some reason anymore. They do not comprise me. They are just kind of all parts and never one thing. It's usually commented on like videos where it's about challenges, you know, like, oh my God, you think you look like this? Actually put your camera over here, turn the light like this, and you're gonna see yourself completely different. You're gonna look so much better. Whatever it is, there's always something about curating yourself, looking at yourself, analyzing every bit of your body and face a separate little entities. And I feel like we have lost the ability to see ourselves as something that grows, changes, and also something that at the same time has an essence 
that doesn't really change regardless of what your outside makeup is. And this is just random people who don't make money off of making stuff on the internet. They don't have to be making these videos. And yet we are at a point where everyone does. That's why I like talking about like content creation as a metaphor for all of this, because we do the same fucking thing. It's just on steroids. Anyway, let's talk about identity and style or aesthetic and theories around it. In the beginning of Greek philosophy, there appeared the important content contrast between Heraclitus, yes, Heraclitus, and the Eleatic school. To Heraclitus, Heraclitus, sorry, all being was in continuous flux. The processes of this world were given form in the variety of unlimited contrasts, which continuously transformed themselves from one into the other. For the Eleatic school, however, there was only a single static essence which transcended the deceiving appearance of the senses. It was all-inclusive and undivided, and it incorporated the absolute undifferentiated unity of all things. Famously, there is a quote by, I mean, it's kind of attributed to a few people, but Heraclitus as well, which is Pateri. I think that's how you pronounce it. My Greek is bad, baby. I do not remember anything. Anyway, which means everything flows. This was specifically Heraclitus idea. And obviously these two ideas are kind of maybe posited as the kind of opposites of each other in Simmel's article that I keep quoting right now. I personally think that both can be true at the same time. And to me, they are but that's a whole other conversation. However, all of this constant change and flow makes us kind of uncomfortable. We crave stability and sense of identity. Sometimes out of a need and sometimes just because it's kind of fun, creating a list of things that make you to be a certain type of person or aesthetic is in many ways therapeutic, a sense of control over others' perception, and sometimes a way to see random objects in your life as something that connects and creates a net that envelops you. I caught 20 arbitrary objects, hobbies, and media. Now, for a moment, I exist. And if someone were to perceive me, or better yet, describe me, <laughs> in a concrete form like a history book. I would be forever preserved in the exact state that I want to be left in forever. But even when you're immortalized in a common Instagram or more exceptional history books way, your identity is always gonna be someone else's. I don't mean that you stole someone's identity. I don't mean that someone is going to copy you or something like that, which they might do for fun. But even the most certain terms are consistently warped because of being online and having random people come across your videos and commenting their thoughts. <laughs> However stupid or purposeless they are, you get to know how much people hear only what they want to hear. Obviously experiences paint people's perceptions, but the eagerness and lack of self-awareness in people's judgments can still be very jarring. The horror of being perceived is really not that big of a deal. What is going to change your life? With this prioritization of aesthetics and creation of distance from oneself is the fact that all things that happen, be it a good or a bad thing, in terms of um, sensations and what it does to you, they all become equalized through aestheticization. This is where our obsession with the aesthetic of suffering comes from. It seems to be impossible for any phenomenon to avoid being reduced to what is important and of eternal value. Even the lowest, intrinsically ugly phenomenon can be dissolved into context of color and form of feeling and experience which provide it with exciting significance. To involve ourselves deeply and lovingly with even the most common product which would be banal and repulsive in its isolated appearance enables us to conceive of it too as a ray and image of the final unity of all things from which beauty and meaning flow. Every philosophical system, even religion, every moment of our heightened emotional experience searches for symbols which are appropriate for their expression.
if we pursue this possibility of aesthetic appreciation to its final point, we find that there are no essential differences among things. Our worldview turns into aesthetic pantheism. Every point contains within itself the potential of being redeemed to absolute aesthetic importance. Here is a horrible experience, and here is a great experience. Here is a horrible person and a great person. And both can be broken down to color or a color scheme, a sound, a string of words that can make a metaphor that recreates a moment as poetry. And if everything, down to things that might have negative connotations, can be beautified, then the difference between those experiences is gone and aesthetic becomes just another aesthetic, becomes just another experience like all others. Funniest thing about talking about this is genuinely how this conversation never fucking ends. <laughs> While getting duller with its repetition, but never really losing its truth. Every time I talk about anything, literally anything, especially in an essay form, I arrive at a point of who gives a flying fuck? And not because I'm worried about others not finding it interesting, but because I myself lose interest mid-sentence usually. And then a while later, I'm back on my bullshit again, like <laughs> trying to define the undefinable and getting annoyed by this need. Like we've been over this. Who? cares who cares who cares if they cannot be conceptualized at least one can point them out as those unknown forces which give form to the matter of our existence breaking an experience or character down to a few words can be fun but it is limiting and requires a web of cultural references that are only understood by people who study types of aesthetics then experience people and things as they are are you a witch ballet core tomato makeup girl babe that's gibberish to literally everybody else who's not chronically online like you and i <laughs> all this to say I be damned before I start to curate myself to be an image rather than a person and I'd be damned if I have to talk about the same shit over and over and over again like downtown girl aesthetic or clean girl aesthetic and adding at the end of the video essay to make it you know fall in line with all the other fashion video essay commentary channels that this is just a way to make us buy more things this is just a way to make us buy more as if it's like not obvious <laughs> anyway this is just a quick little talk all right about sociological aesthetics in conversation with um simul i guess because <laughs> i have uh you know I have quoted him way too much in this video, not to say that it's in conversation with him. Come on now. In any case, thank you for watching this. Uh, let me know what you think. What do you want to talk about next? And I will see you next with a silly little video of um, me and my assistant by assistant reacting to bottoms. Sorry about it. Sorry. There is not going to be any type of correlation. This is a mess of a channel and it's going to stay that way. By the way, I don't think that it's that messy. I think that there's still some kind of feeling going through the essence or whatever. But I don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, anyone who gets it, gets it. And if you don't get it, well, I don't know. It is what it is. <laughs>